This video is brought to you by Atlas VPN. Three things will happen today. First, we'll review the words spoken by Queen Cleopatra's director. Second, we'll review the words spoken by Queen Cleopatra's producer, Jada Pinkett Smith. And then three, what? Who's there? Will Smith is here? Okay, tell him to wait. All right, send him in. Surprise! Three, and mark my words on this one, freaking screenshot this. I will do more with this video to help, support and, since they like this word, empower black people as a whole and specifically black women than this mockery of a documentary ever could. Am I promising a lot? Well, put me to the test on section two of this video. Hello and everyone, welcome back to my channel, this is the Metatron speaking. This is the second video I make on the topic of Netflix Cleopatra, not because I particularly enjoy talking about it, but simply because the official responses of the director and producer of this farce, namely their responses to the backlash they justifiably received, managed to make their case in the eyes of the public even worse than it already was. And that's saying something, considering the staggering like to dislike ratio on their trailer. You would think they couldn't possibly make it worse for themselves, but <laughs> oh, they did. And this is not just to make fun of the laughable statement that we could all, of course, predict. If you don't like it, it's because you're racist. Literally, this word has been misused and overused so much it completely lost any power and now means absolutely nothing. They literally call racist anyone for anything. Since the word racist doesn't mean anything anymore, let's make a new definition right now. Racist definition, a person who participates to a race. Example, 32 enthusiastic racists were ready to begin their Grand Prix. Let's read. Why shouldn't Cleopatra be a melanated sister? And why do some people need Cleopatra to be white? Her proximity to whiteness seems to give her value, and for some Egyptians it seems to really matter. Let's make this Crystal Palace clear. We don't need her to be white. No one needs her to be white. We only want her to look Greek, because she was Greek. Greek. For a small disclaimer that it won't matter, if it was proven by documented facts and evidence that she was in fact 100% black, or even 50% black, and a documentary showed her and represented her to be white, I would bitch all the same. As I have demonstrated on my video on whitewashing, I am against all sorts of washing, let's just represent people how they actually were. Doing the research, goodness gracious, I already have a problem with this statement, it's just the beginning of the sentence. And justifiably so. Considering the results of such research, one cannot help but ask, how was this research in fact conducted? Considering the fact that the overwhelming evidence, according to the concurrent understanding over the spectrum of available data, points towards a direction that is completely different to what you have represented. That is a fair question. Since you chose to use the word research and you chose to use the word documentary, what analytic methods and research procedures have you implemented to ensure reliable data collection? Likewise, on a broader scale, what methodology and criteria have you used to select the most fitting and appropriate historical figures for this, once again, historical Black Queen documentary series of yours? Well, the results of this research clearly indicate two possibilities. Either there is a catastrophic lack of the interdisciplinary expertise in the range of quantitative and qualitative methods needed for high-quality research, or the motivations behind making this documentary was never to tell the historical truth, but it was in fact a political message. Spoiler alert, it's the latter. As she herself stated. Check this out. Doing the research I realized what a political act it would be to see Cleopatra portrayed by a black actress. She later says, I realized the magnitude and political nature of this job. She said it in her own words. So in other words, you've just demonstrated that in the production of your documentary, when a historical individual fails to meet a specific arbitrary criteria you have chosen, namely the queen needs to be back no matter what, your solution to the matter is not to actually choose a black queen, it's to race swap. Outrage? <laughs> this is nothing. Check this out. Here is a comment the director received from an Egyptian in Cairo, a comment she specifically considered to be ridiculous. That is, of course, before they completely removed the possibility to leave comments in that documentary trailer. Freedom of speech, bye-bye. She says, Amir in his bedroom in Cairo wrote to me to earnestly appeal that Cleopatra was Greek. Oh lad, why would that be a good thing to you, Amir? You're Egyptian! 
So let me get this logic straight. Amir is Egyptian, hence he cannot like the historical truth that a character is Greek because that does nothing to him, hence he must not fight for historical accuracy because he's not Greek. So, from the point of view of this person, the coherent representation of historical characters does nothing for people unless they happen to coincide with their ethnicity. Who's obsessed with skin and ethnicity now? Who's the racist? Us or her? You be the judge. Also, while you do that, just want to let you know that I came out with my new ring, the Ring of the Noble One. If you don't know anything about this, I'll leave a link to a dedicated video where I explain what this is. We already got a lot of orders. Thank you so much, Noble Ones. Stand for historical truth, brothers. She then proceeds to add, We need to have a conversation with ourselves about our colorism and the internalized white supremacy that Hollywood has indoctrinated us with. White supremacy has literally zero to do with wanting historical characters to be represented in an historically accurate way, particularly when the word documentary is used. She says we need to liberate our imaginations. Absolutely, but not while making a documentary we needn't. Let me liberate my imagination and say that the ancient Roman Empire actually never existed. Oh wait. Moving on to actress and series producer Jada Pinkett Smith. Jada Pinkett Smith defended the decision for a black Cleopatra as important. Let's see why it's important. We don't often get to see or hear stories about black queens and that was really important for me as well as for my daughter and just for my community to be able to know those stories because there are tons of them. There are tons of them, and underline this. The sad part is that we don't have readily access to these historical women who were so powerful and were the backbones of African nations, Smith said. No. The sad part is that in order to see black queens for you, for your daughter, for your community, you chose to race swap a character who we know was Greek instead of using a real black warrior queen, one of tons, as you said effectively wasting a massive opportunity to actually show a real black warrior queen. And this is what really gets me. You had the money and the power to do what you said you would do, and instead you chose to slap the face of your people because actions speak louder than words. And by choosing a queen of Greek descent to be represented as a black queen, you basically publicly stated that of all the black, actual black queens of African history, none of them was interesting and you had to go look for a Greek white queen instead and make her black. If I were black, I'd feel betrayed. If your intent, madam, was really guided by the goal of having a transformative impact into the educational aspect of the historically based film industry, in the sense that all we see is white people's history, why don't we see some black people's history on screen? Then you would have chosen a real historical black warrior queen, one of the many you mention, but you clearly don't know anything about. Now, if you're like me and you like to surf the internet looking for interesting historical information, it's a great idea to do it in safety, which is why you should totally use today's sponsor, Atlas VPN. A VPN is a virtual private network that makes all of your internet traffic travel through an encrypted tunnel, and this way it protects you from spying, public Wi-Fi dangers, it hides your IP address and online activities. Atlas VPN is a great choice because it was developed by cyber security specialists, and among other things, it gives you access to the data breach monitor, which is a security feature designed to track any data breaches related to your online account, automatically scanning any leaked information. But another add-on through Atlas VPN is the fact that you can use Netflix from any countries regardless of where you are. So let's say that you wanted to watch a show that is only available in the UK but you live in America. No problem, just change your country through the VPN and boom, access granted. I always have Atlas VPN active on my machine, so that is because one account lets you use multiple devices. I personally really like Atlas VPN not only because it's a great choice, but also because it's really affordable, and that links to today's special offer. So, grab the big deal. $1.83 a month for 3 years plus 3 months for free and 30 days money back guarantee. So, if you've been considering getting a VPN but you weren't sure about the prices, then now is the time. And don't forget to click the link in the description. That's $1.83 a month for 3 years plus 3 months for free. Keep in mind that this is a time limited offer, so be quick and click the link in the description. And big thanks to Atlas VPN for sponsoring my video.
I will now deliver what I have promised. I will use my platform to do what you could and should have done with your documentary. I will now tell you about the most fearsome historical black women warrior queens from real, historical, documented, recorded history. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you to the Kandake. Welcome to section two. Let's review what they wanted, let's see what they delivered, and let's see what I can today deliver. They wanted a black woman, queen, a warrior, a queen of kings, equal to male rulers in power, who faced a European power such as the Romans and defeated them in battle, possibly with strong cultural connections to Egypt. With this in mind, this is what they delivered. You chose Cleopatra VII, who was a light-skinned Greek queen from a foreign dynasty, who lost against the Romans, who was a scholar, not a warrior, who was not a queen of kings. I choose the Kandake Amanirenas, who was a black woman, a queen, a warrior, a queen of kings in a matrilineal society, who did face the Romans and defeated them in battle, and who also had very strong connections to Egyptian culture. And while I tell you about the story of this Kandake, I will present a plethora of archaeological, literary and historical evidence to back everything up. We're going to talk about something that happened in the southern borders of the Roman Egyptian prefecture, about the Kingdom of Kush and a title within its society, the Kandake. To be specific in a time spectrum, we're going to talk about something that happened within the 1st century BC and the 1st century AD. Strabo tells us that in 25 BC, by orders of Augustus, the Prefectus Aegypti, Aelius Gallus, began a campaign against Arabia Felix. The overall idea behind this campaign was to secure a trade route between Rome and India that would ensure the acquisition of a numerous amount of precious spices being brought directly to the heart of the empire, creating this connection through the Red Sea. Now, the overall problem with this campaign is that it was ultimately a failure, mostly due to the fact that there was the outbreak of an infectious disease or a pandemic that killed off quite a few legionaries. But this was just the beginning of Rome's problems. You see, because of all of these troops and legions that were moved and eventually lost away from the Roman prefecture of Egypt in Africa Proconsularis, Egypt now was not well garrisoned. But an enemy to Rome will take advantage of that. An enemy that the Romans themselves call and describe as ferocious, an enemy that was prepared, mobilizing their troops from the heart of Africa against the southern province of Egypt, which was under Roman control, the Kingdom of Kush. Egypt being left unguarded was the perfect opportunity for the southern neighbor of the empire, those who Cassio Dio and Strabo call Ethiopians, launched an immediate offensive with over 30,000 soldiers against the southern borders of Roman Egypt. This above-mentioned army of 30,000 strong was led by the ferocious black queen warrior, the Kandake. In the classical sources, we are always told about this so-called kingdom of the Ethiopians, but this has generic implications, and generally speaking is intended to mean people of sub-Saharan descent, so black people. But in this case, however, when it comes to these invaders, we are talking specifically about the Kingdom of Kush. The territory of the Kingdom of Kush would correspond with a region called Nubia, divided in Low Nubia, so the Lower Nubia, which also included the southern part of Egypt, and Upper Nubia, the northern part of modern-day Sudan, for geographical reference. For slightly deeper historical context, the first Kingdom of Kerma and then Kingdom of Kush had been both tributary and adversaries to Egypt, well before the Romans entered the picture. This will be important to understand the connection of the Kandake to actual Egyptian culture, specifically to the Egyptians' high priests. Let's talk war now. According to Strabo and Cassius Dio, the Kandake is the name of the Queen of the Ethiopians who attacked Egypt. But in reality, it's not a proper name. That was their misunderstanding. It's a title. It's a composite term in the Meroitic language, deriving from the word Kanda, which means woman, and the particle Ke, which could translate as possessor or owner. This is usually a title that is given to the sister of the king. But here's the thing. When the king dies, and there is only the sister, because the society of the kingdom of Kush was matrilinear, which means that she would be the mother of the prince, she would be in charge. She would be treated like the king, at least until her son would come of age. Also, some Kandake Meroitic inscriptions hold the title of Kore, which means king or sovereign, which further demonstrate that when their brother or king would die, they would become the de facto reigning ruler. In other words, they had a position equal to that of male rulers. But were they warrior queens? Well, there are a few Kandake that I would like to mention to answer that. 
The Kandake Amanishaketo, between the 1st century BC and the 1st century AD, is often represented with bow and arrow as she holds prisoners. The following Kandake, Amanitore, massacres enemies wielding a sword, together with her son, who instead is wielding an axe of swords. These are all direct descendants of the Kandake Amanireas, which we are talking about today. It's not just one black warrior queen, it's a line, a whole dynasty of black warrior queens. Strabo describes Amanirenas to be man-like, masculine, and also she was blind in one eye. The initial part of the offensive is very favorable for the Kushites. In fact, they managed to completely massacre three cohorts that constituted the garrison of the southern borders, as they were defending the city of Siene. They then proceed to attack the cities of Philo and Elephantina. Finding almost no resistance, they managed to get slaves, but they also take something that really makes the Romans mad. The loot that they gather as they raise and sack these towns includes an amazing bronze statue of Emperor Gaius Julius Caesar Octavianus Augustus. Now the Romans are outraged. They want the statue of the Emperor back. So the Roman response begins. The Imperial Roman response sees the new prefect of Egyptian province Publius Petronius with a legion of 10,000 infantry and 800 cavalry moving south. They then reach the city of Selkis in northern Nubia. Before engaging, they demand the Kushite queen, Kandake, to give back the statue of the emperor, but she ignores them for three days. This is the Roman Empire we're talking about. If this doesn't show courage, bravery and strength, I don't know what does. As their demand receives no answer, the Romans deploy for combat. As the Kushite warriors led by the queen face the Romans, they are defeated in an open pitch battle, as it often happens when the Romans are faced while they do what they know how to do best, regardless of being outnumbered. However, Strabo gives us two specific reasons as to why the Kushite are defeated by the Romans in this massive battle. First, they tell us they were not well equipped, in the sense that the only defense that these warriors had was a tall cowhide shield and a disorganized array of swords, spears and some axes. Second, they tell us that their captains weren't particularly professional. The town is therefore occupied by the Romans and the nearby fortress of Primis is taken. The Roman prefect Publius Petronius decides then to continue his march and go further into the kingdom of Kush. He reaches the important city of Napata that he conquers, raises and burns to the ground, taking the population as slaves to Egypt. Strabo then tells us that after taking Napata, the prefect decides to stop. He returns to Alexandria and leaves a strong garrison in the nearby fort. They underestimated them once, they're not gonna do it again. The Romans learn from their mistakes. The Kandake Amanirens, however, decides to begin immediately a counter-offensive and storms the fortress facing once again the Roman, forcing the Roman prefect to go back to defend. It is at this time that something extremely curious from a historical point of view, in fact even mysterious, happens. The Kandake writes a letter directly to Emperor Augustus, and he replies. The contents of the letter are actually quite interesting. She has a whole list of demands, and the Emperor grants them all. Why? You see, archaeology in this case is extremely important because it will help us to identify the reasons behind this discrepancy between the historical tales that tell us that, yes, the Kushite were strong, but the Romans just massacred them and that was the end of the situation, and then this letter, which instead seems to paint a different picture. If the Kushites were defeated so easily, if the Kandaka were not really that much of a problem, then why did the Emperor grant their demands? Well, a temple might have the answer to our question. Specifically, the temple E-292 at Mero. In 1910, during excavations at Mero, the ancient capital of the Kingdom of Kush, a bronze head of a Roman statue was discovered representing Emperor Augustus. This was clearly the head of the statue that they had stolen and never given back. Now here is the kicker. Where were the statue found? In this temple, buried underneath the staircase to the temple. What this means is that symbolically, every single day, pilgrims, Kushite warriors, the population, would be literally stomping on top of the head of the Roman Emperor every time they would enter and exit at the temple. Picture that for a moment. Also, the temple is mostly in its iconography and depictions representing scenes of war, including representing several prisoners 
who are clearly wearing Roman clothes. And to further identify these prisoners as Romans, which are also found in several temples in the Kingdom of Kush, we see the following word underneath. The ethnonym Tameya. The etymology of this Meroitic word is believed to begin in Egypt and in Egyptian, in fact specifically to the word THM. Now, this word in Egyptian meant specifically a Libyan and a non-Egyptian from Libya. But in the Meroitic language, it gains several other meanings. It means a non-Egyptian from the north. And generally, this is meant to be any population that is an Egyptian and lives in the area, but we also find it several times used to mean specifically the Romans. Because at the end of the day, they were northern non-Egyptians, weren't they? And we find this word underneath the representations of what seem to be prisoners that look Roman. Now, these temples were dedicated to this specific Kandake. They were built by her, and they show the Kandake taking prisoners from Rome several times. So maybe what this suggests is that even though at the end of this entire situation the Romans did overcome the Kushites and put a stop to their invasions, maybe it wasn't such an easy task as the Roman writers want us to believe it was. And it also means that perhaps there were other expeditions against Rome from the Kingdom of Kush that we are just not told about. Now this story, which is fully documented, already shows you what a missed opportunity this was to just choose and represent Cleopatra as a black woman, whereby they could have talked about the Kandake. It shows that they don't care about historical accuracy, they never did. But I do have a question for you. And even if you hate my guts, I ask you right now to be honest. Did you know about this story. Did you know about the Kandak in general and specifically about this offensive against the Romans? If the answer is no, then I have delivered what I had promised. And I did more for the empowerment, support and representation of black people in general and specifically black women that this documentary ever could. Alright everyone, thank you so much for watching, I hope you enjoyed this video, if you did please remember thumbs up and don't forget to click the link in the description to make use of the amazing offer by Atlas VPN. Thank you so much for watching and remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye.